Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be back in Philippine Startup Week 2021. Once again, I'm Juan Jimenez, and I'm part of the Philippine Investments team of Open Space Ventures. So we kicked off this week with a talk by our partner, Hian Go, and our director of investments, Jervin Yang, on what we believe are the four fundamentals that founders should be focused on to scale their startup. Today, we're going to be diving a bit deeper into scaling, specifically on different aspects of founders or of startup operations that founders will have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And today, I'm actually joined by members of our operations team who are experts in various fields and who can share with us the various insights that they have um, and the various things that they've observed with our successful portfolio companies that Filip Filipino founders can also apply to their own startups. Today's session is going to be a founders ask me anything. So feel free to type any questions that you have for our operations team members or for myself in the box. We'll, you know, we have the whole hour today, so we're going to try to get to each of those questions. And hopefully you're going to learn something from today's talk as we explore the elements of startup success. But before we get into that and before I bring my colleagues uh, up on stage, I'd love to introduce Open Space Ventures to everyone in the audience for those who haven't met me before or for those who haven't met any of my team members. So we've, we're a re leading re regional venture capital fund and we've been investing with active intelligence in Southeast Asia since 2014. From a single office in Singapore, we are now uh, fully covered across Southeast Asia. We have five offices. I'm based here in Manila, but we also have offices in Bangkok, Ho Chi Minh City, and Jakarta, and our HQ is in Singapore. We have the capabilities now to invest all the way from early stage to the mid stage as we are investing out of two funds, uh, our OSV3 and OSV+. Plus. We have 39 portfolio companies, which I'll be showing you uh, later on uh, across various sectors and various geographies. And if there's one thing that sets us apart, it's our active approach to investing with our dedicated in-house tech and operations team, um, who I will be introducing later on, who will be joining me later for uh, our talk today. So our portfolio, as I mentioned, is uh, 39 portfolio companies across different countries in Southeast Asia, from you know, the five geographies I mentioned earlier um, to even in countries such as Myanmar, Bangladesh, and Malaysia. Uh, we have a good mix of B2C and B2B companies, and I'm sure some logos on this page uh, look familiar to everyone in the audience. Uh, we were one of the, we were the actually first uh, institutional investor in, in Kumu, um, you know, the Philippines' first uh, startup to ever raise a Series C investment. We're also an investor in Beauty MNL, which is uh, the Philippines' largest homegrown cosmetics and wellness site. And earlier this year, we also invested in our third Philippine startup, which is Sarisuki, a community, community group buying uh, platform uh, for fresh and essential goods led by uh, Brian Ku. Um, you'll also see, you know, some regional winners on our portfolio. Uh, Go2 is on the upper left uh, over here. Previously, Gojek, uh, we were actually one of their first investors as well. You might also recognize Finaxel, uh, a leading fintech uh, in Indonesia that announced their plans to, uh, to list uh, early next year. And uh, for the ladies in the audience, you might recognize Love Bonito, who um, you know expanded regionally, and they're actually you know getting good progress here in the Philippines by being a female, uh, a leader in female fast fashion across Southeast Asia. Uh, our team is very diverse, uh, as I mentioned. Um, you know, not just in nationalities. Uh, we have twelve different nationalities on our team, but also by. Uh, background. So I sit on the investments team, and my background is in finance, but. Um, as I said, a core part of our investment strategy is to be active investors. And uh, the, the core of that active investment strategy is our operations team, uh, who you can see here on the right-hand side. So our operations team is made up of uh, domain experts in various fields, from technology to marketing, HR, uh, engineering, data science, and ESG. And their primary focus is to really help each of our portfolio companies scale. Um, so when we invest, we bring on more than just capital, we bring on the resources of our experts. 
and we uh, help our founders in, in every aspect that we, uh, we see fit. Um, so today, uh, as I mentioned, our talk is really going to be focused less on the investment side, which is well covered by you know, all of the other talks in Philippine Startup Week. But we really wanted to explore really what we've observed working with our successful portfolio companies and uh, the founders and teams of those companies as to you know, what made them uh, successful startups in Southeast Asia. And we hope that uh, you know, the Filipino founders in the audience and the aspiring founders in the audience um, take uh, some of that advice and apply it to their own startups. Um, and again, it's, uh, today is going to be an AMA session. Um, so please, please, uh, you know, ask anything that you, you feel would be of help. Uh, today, we are going to be joined by three members of our operations team. Uh, Freddie, who is our expert on marketing, Jack, who is our expert in ESG and impact, and Wenpo, who is our expert in technology and engineering. Um, so with that, I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, and maybe we could bring on the other speakers and allow them to introduce themselves. So maybe we can start off with uh, Freddie. Freddie, if you'd like to introduce yourself to the audience, uh, what you do at Open Space, uh, what you did before Open Space, take it away. Sure. Well, thank you, Juancho, for the introduction to Open Space as well. Um, very well done. Uh, it's great to be here, everyone. I'm super excited to obviously be, be part of Philippine Startup Week. Uh, I think Juancho and Jervin and, and Hien over the course of the past few days have really emphasized, you know, the, the, the passion we've got for uh, what's happening in Philippines. Uh, you know, we've been looking at it for quite a few years now. So to be part of an event like this is, is really quite exciting. So as, as Juancho said, you know, we've got a pretty awesome, I'm talking about my colleagues more than anything, uh, operations team at Open Space and uh, various different expertises. So I guess mine is a bit of a kind of roundabout route into venture capital. Um, you know, I actually started uh, in uh, branding and consulting. Um, so I, my first role was actually in a agency that focused on uh, consumer psychology and ethnography. And that wasn't actually where I thought I, I would start. And, and it, got, it actually is quite foundational to my belief around what makes good brands and good marketing. And, you know, I was very glad to have had that foundation and learn about the importance of actually getting out on the ground, talking to people, understanding why they do what they do. And it kind of formed my, my, my theory that you, you won't create great brands if you don't really spend enough time doing that. And of course, you know, one, one contention I've often felt is that maybe we don't as, as brands and businesses do that enough. And if I can share like maybe one story um, that kind of when I was doing that psychology work and that motivational work that really kind of captured the, the importance was I was in India and we were doing a project at the time for, a, for an air conditioning company, which kind of in theory doesn't sound like the most fascinating, but you know, we were having conversations with various people in, in their homes and really kind of understanding the role air conditioning was playing. And we couldn't figure out why the category wasn't growing and why people weren't getting engaged by it. And it said like one guy in this conversation said, um, you know, it's not that I, I want you to blow cold air, I want you to remove hot air. And it was like one comment he said that completely like changed the way we thought about it, right? And we started looking at the brands and saying, well, actually every code, every design code, all the communications and the messaging was all around being cold. You know, a lot of the brands use those wind motifs or, or blue colors. And actually people didn't want to have cold air blown at them. They wanted to know that it was removing hot air. So actually that was kind of the moment where I said, well, if you don't have conversations with people and you just sit in a boardroom and discuss it yourself, then you know, you're going to miss out on a lot. So I did that for a while. And then I, I went into a branding and, and design consultancy called, called Landor. Uh, it's probably the biggest in the world. It's one of those companies that has designed a lot of the brands that you probably use that you have equally never heard of the actual designer behind them. Um, but there we really focused on, you know, the brand strategy, you know, which encompasses, you know, as you will know, so many elements of, of a way a business expresses itself and, and signals to the world. Um, as well as obviously going into the design element and the communications element as well. Um, and through that, I, I came into contact with, with Open Space and, you know, we, we had lots of chats and we said, you know, if you really think about, you know, the, the value of a company and a business, so much of it is intangible, right? And so if you're not going to, you know, nurture that intangible asset as much as you try and nurture the more tangible uh, parts of the P&L, then, then are we really leaving money on the table? And, 
you know, that was kind of the conclusion we got to and, and thank, thankfully we did. And, you know, I've been at Open Space now for just over half a year and been working very, very closely with the team, with Wembo, Jacqueline, some of the others that you see and, and also, you know, with our portfolio companies. So it's great to be here and, and look forward to this conversation today. Thanks a lot, Freddie. Um, I'm sure, you know, many of the startup founders and the, the audience can learn a lot from you from, you know, branding and marketing as you know, that's, that's something that, you know, we get uh, asked actually, or, or we, we, or they are asked from us on the investments team all the time, right? We always ask how they acquire their customers, how they think about their brand, etc. cetera. Mm. Um, so maybe we can move on to, to Jack, if you'd like to introduce yourself and, you know, give, give the same sort of spiel that, that, that Freddie did. Yeah. Hey guys, good to be here uh, with everyone. So um, I work on ESG and impact at Open Space, and uh, you know what that means is really we work with portfolio companies to identify the different risks around environmental, um, social, or governance, um, and equally also look at the kinds of opportunities that certain ESG trends are creating. Right. So whether kind of the change in climate or the push towards uh, better data governance or better data privacy or um, you know, having better AI governance, uh, how, how these create different business opportunities for startups. Uh, so my background actually, you know, is, is I guess, from a partly regulatory um, uh, perspective, right? So I, I grew up, I guess, in the Singapore government, uh, which, as you know, is uh, very good at creating policies that protect our people. And so I did 10 years of that uh, in the Ministry of Law, as well as the Ministry of Health. Um, and thereafter, after creating all these policies, I basically moved to a regional healthcare company where I did product development uh, and business development and where I was busy complying with these policies that I created. Um, so after having kind of spent two to three years in there, I uh, thought it was time to check out um, the startup world and, you know, got into the VC ecosystem, uh, getting ready to kind of innovate and, you know, build companies from, from scratch and from bottom up and kind of help them to uh, bridge that gap between what do you do as a startup um, and how do you prepare for regulations, uh, changes in regulations or changes in expectations uh, from consumers uh, or from other businesses uh, in, in, in terms of thinking about how to grow your company. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's me. Should it be longer or Juancho, should I pass it over to Wimbo? <laughs> No, that that's that's totally fine. Uh, one poem, maybe you wanna. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, sure. Wangjo. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks everyone for having me today. Uh, my name is Wenbo. As one uh, one commission, I'm the VP of engineering. Basically, I'm the uh, one of the tech guys in the firm. Uh, my role with Open Space Ventures is mainly twofold. One is to uh, conduct technical due diligence before investment. So this is part of the uh, investment process that we uh, have in place. So not only we look at the commercials, the business side of things, we also look at ESG, marketing, branding, and also, and of course, technology. Uh, the other part, which I actually spend more time on is uh, working with our CTOs post-investment. Uh, uh, I joined OpenSpace about three years ago. Uh, I have worked with a few companies very closely. So, so basically the, the things that uh, there are different levels of engagement uh, we could have with the CTOs. Sometimes it's like consulting sessions every quarter or every now and then. Sometimes it's really very, uh, uh, very, very closely uh, collaboration. So I was in a couple of situations where I was referred to as the interim CTO in the board meetings, which gave me lots of pressure. So yeah, I think the, 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 the then it's really, uh, it could be the architecture, could be team processes, and team structure and so on. So anything that uh, the company, when as and when the company needs our help, uh, we are always there uh, trying to help uh, the best we can. So yeah, feel free to post any question to me and to all of us. So we'd be happy to uh, answer your question. Also, also hear uh, you know uh, what you think about some topics. Okay, thanks a lot, Wenbo. We already actually have uh, questions flowing in here, um, but I think the best one to take in is something that's, you know, something that I was planning to kick off the session with anyway, right? Um, the first question is, how is the investments team department different from the operations team and how does open space venture set 
itself apart from other investors and how do we differ in terms of taking care of our portfolio companies so i'll i'll start i'll start off with that and then you guys can sort of um, add uh, especially with the second question right so um it's it's right to think that the investments team and operations team within open space you know are, are different departments but you know we are still uh, ultimate we all ultimately still share one goal right which is to uh, scale our startups and make sure that they can achieve uh, the returns that we promise to our investors um, i wouldn't say that we you know operate separately from each other um, we work uh, closely with each other um, on the investments team the only difference is you know we're going out there looking for investments but we definitely need the operations team to help us evaluate these investments and after we invest, um, you know, they will be the ones who are working closely uh, with our portfolio companies. Because if it were the investments team advising on something like technology or on marketing or on ESG, we might just break something, right? So uh, we'd rather let our uh, our experts here today with uh, to here with us on the call today advise on all of these topics, and they work with us full time, right? So it's not as if they're just with us on a consulting basis. Their responsibility is really to um, help each each portfolio company out in any way they can. So they are what sets us apart, right? And I think to drive home that point, uh, what would be helpful, uh, Freddie, Wenpo, or Jack, is to talk about how you know you have gone into a particular situation we've had with a portfolio company, uh, where you think we added value, having a full operations team that a lot of other VCs in the region do not necessarily have. Um, Freddie, I'll let you start. I think you already have an idea. You already unmuted your, your mic, so <laughs> take, take it away. <laughs> I'll unmute you for an open conversation, but sure. If that's a signal that apparently I was ready to talk, that's yeah, so wrong with it. Now, I was going to say, just like, I guess, to, to add to your point, Vancho, like a, almost a bit of personal trivia, right? So I actually came to work uh, at Open Space, but my first uh, engagement with Open Space was actually as a consultant on the outside working on the Open Space brand. So to kind of re-emphasize what Juancho was saying around the operations team really setting open space apart, you know, as a consultant outside, right, you, you work with a lot of companies and you do a lot of interviews and you talk to a lot of people and you, they tell you a lot of great things uh, and you just have to believe that they're true, right? Uh, and so when I was outside open space, I heard a lot about the operations team and how they work with the investment team and the value they add. You know, and then I've had the privilege of actually joining Open Space and, and confirming that, that what they told me on the outside was, was absolutely true. And, and it is something that genuinely sets us apart, right? And I think it's a lot of people can claim it, but very few people actually deliver on it. And, you know, few people have the kind of team that you see in Wembo and Jacqueline and some of the others, you know, actually in-house and fully, fully employed, focused, you know, as a sort of freelance in-house consultant working day to day with, with all our portfolio companies. So, you know, I always say to, to, to the founders, right, in the end, we are, we are a free resource to you, right? We are an extra pair of hands in your team. And, you know, it, even if you don't want to take on our advice and that's really up to you, you know, you'd be mad not to listen. Right. And I think they always find that that level of consultation quite, quite helpful. So I think that's a really important way. Um, and then maybe I'll let, one of the others maybe talk about an opportunity or an experience they've had where they've felt the Optium has brought value. Yeah, I guess um, I can jump in here. So um, I can actually think of two examples, I guess one where I've worked with Wenbo and one where I've worked with Freddie um, with other portfolio companies. And, you know, with Wenbo, I guess we looked at kind of the risk side, right? And looking at kind of governance and how cybersecurity obviously is really important uh, for tech companies to start to, to look at and address. Um, it really helps in terms of getting enterprise uh, uh, contracts. And it also really helps in terms of just assuring people that your uh, system is kind of as, as waterproof as it should be. So, you know, one boy and I actually had a couple of consultations with uh, cybersecurity experts to determine whether say ISO 27001 or SOC 2 is better for our portfolio companies. Uh, so that's where we really kind of try and add value, right? We'll go out there, we'll do the research for you, we'll talk to some consultants, and then put you in touch with people that can help you to implement these uh, in a way that makes the most sense for, for your portfolio company. So that's uh, something that we worked on. Uh, Freddie and I actually did uh, kind of a branding slash ESG uh, workshop with, uh, with Love Benito. 
who actually came to us because, you know, obviously they're, they're a fashion company and they're looking at different ways in which I guess they can be more socially as well as environmentally responsible. And so we worked with them to figure out, you know, what kind of aligns with the brand, uh, what do you feel is important for you to really lean into and, you know, make sure that you do as a company. And Love Benito is extremely focused uh, on women, obviously, and on empowering women in different communities. And so they said, you know, yes, it's really important for us to have, um, you know, a social kind of vendor guideline to say, ensure that labor practices are, are, are being properly carried out in your factories. Um, they want to make sure that people are paying fair wages. And, you know, around the environment, they also want to start uh, managing uh, waste better, right, and reducing waste uh, along their production line. So I think just some of the things that that we do with companies that really kind of uh, either help to manage their risks or help them to value create and build a better brand. And yeah, maybe I'll let, I guess, either Freddie or, or Wimp will add to that. Sure, yeah, Freddie, you are still unmute, but uh, maybe I can share my story. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I totally share the same view as Freddie. So when I came to uh, I came to Open Space for interviews three years ago, uh, I was told the same thing, right? How Open Space set apart from the rest by having this full time operations team. Uh, but I learned this firsthand only three months after I joined Open Space. So that was June 2019. Uh, what happened was that the VP of Engineering in Tiny Hub just resigned. Uh, even though his title was VP, but he was the de facto CTO. He was the the, the top the top uh, uh, tech leader, right? So it, he resigned at the worst possible time because Tiny Hub just closed around with us a few months ago. The orders were increasing, and they already plan to uh, re refactor a core part of the system, which is the order processing flow. I think that's really the worst time to resign. Uh, there was lots of uh, I would say anxiety in the management. Uh, they felt that, okay, was the system going to collapse or something like that? Right? Are they going to disappoint the investors, the new investors? So that was the time I came in and work, started to work very closely with the team. Uh, they already had some idea like what, what they wanted to do, but what is lacking, what was missing at that time was really to translate the idea into a detailed design that is implementable. So this is very uh, important step because everyone can talk about architecture, but you have to realize it in the end of the day. And that translation part is what you know tells uh, a part an experienced engineer versus the, the junior ones, right? Of course, there are other issues like how the, the team was structured and processed and so on. But long story short, I started to have like, almost daily calls with them I flew to Jakarta about uh, once a month. So uh, I never traveled that much before. Uh, then, so yeah, in the end, we managed to redesign the uh, core uh, order processing flow with uh, event-driven architecture, which is much more scalable and uh, extensible in the sense that we're able to connect uh, another new system uh, as we wish, because you just need to pick up the event and process it accordingly. So, and at the same time, I helped Tiny Hub to find the next CTO, uh, which actually took more than six months. So it's not an easy job to find the right CTO. I think we got a bit lucky. We really find a very capable uh, CTO for Tiny Hub after about eight months time. So once the new CTO was on board, I started to face out a little bit and focus my time on other uh, uh, companies in, in our portfolio. So I think this is really uh, what, uh, I, I think we stay true to our statement. Uh, we have this full-time team, which we will be able to plug in the situation to really help our company move forward. I think yeah. just just to add, as as both Jacqueline and Wembo were talking, it kind of reminded me of, of one of the things I think does make the operations team so valuable, right, is, is when we come across founders, right, obviously kind of at early stage, pre-series A often, you know, a founder has to be so focused on, the day-to-day -day running of their business, the product, fighting fires inevitably. And like I think as an external, you know, venture capital firm, we kind of know what it will take to scale and grow. And so part of what we do is kind of act like agent provocateurs, right? And we go in and we kind of surface problems that they may not even know that they have, or 
may not know are just just around the corner, right? So, you know, with, with, with for instance, with with Pluang in, in Indonesia, you know, when I first engaged with them, you know, I don't think they realized they had an identity problem, a perception problem, that the structure of the team was was wrong, that they weren't being able to create the maximum amount of content that they needed to 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 feed the, the funnel because of the systems they had in place. And I think sometimes it takes someone to come in and, and kind of tell them the hard truth and, and say, well, you know, here's the problem you've got and, and we're here to help you fix it. And if they trust us and we hope that they do, then we get very involved in, in doing that. But I think that is a real value, right? Is it's kind of surfacing problems that they may not know that they have. Yeah, I totally agree. And I mean, because we've seen so many different portfolio companies grow up in different industries and different geographies, we get to kind of lean on that wealth of experience that um, you might not have as a startup founder that's just focusing on one com uh, one country right now or one industry right now. And we've seen, you know, what needs to happen when you say bring on a new business line or when you acquire um, a different product line or expand upstream or downstream. Right. Similarly, we've also seen, you know, what happens when a company goes from 20 people to 200 people. Right. And the different changes in culture that comes with that and the need to kind of engage with your employees and make sure that kind of the, the culture that you want to create for your company continues to stay as your as your company grows and scales. So I think, yeah, that's definitely one of the, the biggest learning points that I've had coming in as, as the ops team as well. And, you know, similarly, we don't just kind of identify things that we need to do, right? We are really kind of in the trenches with you um, working on them. And that's kind of the main point of a complaint for the operations team, right? Where we're say, we say we're like 0 0.5 FTE for a lot of companies, but we've got, you know, 40, right? So yeah, you, you guys definitely do the, the, the heavy lifting. Um, um, you know, as, as the investments team, we grow our portfolio. It kind of falls on the operations team to make sure uh, each company, you know, has uh, the best possible chance to succeed and scale. Um, so thanks a lot, guys, for, for sharing all of that. Uh, one more, we actually got a follow-up question from, uh, I believe, the media partner for Philippine Startup Week, uh, more on the te technology side of things. Um, sure. And it's more about talent because I think, you know, many people recognize that, you know, the number of startups here in the Philippines is increasing, but um, the talent, you know, it's sort of a lagging, um, it's sort of a lagging indicator, right? It will take some time for talent, especially on the technology side, uh, to pick up. So the question is, you know, how have we helped our, our startups? Maybe you can talk about the ones that we've helped here in the Philippines. Yeah. How have we helped them sort of build uh, that side of the, the equation, right? The talent in the tech team and helping them get ready for, you know, as Jack said, getting from 20 to 200, right? In terms yeah. of employee count. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm not sure whether we can be specific about name, but uh, I think this idea, what we did right, still ongoing uh, right now, I think definitely applies to uh, other situations as well, right? So I don't think, uh, Philippines is the only country that faces this uh, tech crunch, right? I think it happens everywhere we see, Indonesia, Thailand, everywhere. It's probably just that uh, uh, Philippines as a tech startup, uh, the, the tech startup industry in Philippines is uh, just slightly behind so that the uh, supply of computer science graduates have not reached level to meet the demand, right? The demand is basically driven up by VC money. So we have so many startups uh, currently, and but uh, it takes years to, to produce computer science graduates. So I think in that situation, what we do uh, traditionally that we can uh, outsource the projects to uh, another country, India, or China, Vietnam, for example. Uh, but I don't particularly think this is the best way to for a startup because uh, the truth for startup that the requirements are never clear. The requirements don't change in weeks, they change in days, right? So whenever the founder has some idea, the next moment you want, he wants the idea Im implemented and released tomorrow. So I think given that dynamic, that very fluid situation, uh, I guess the better approach is probably to find some augmentation resource. So what they mean that you, go and find some engineers, some offshore engineers that work full time for you, uh, but you pay 
a company to manage the people for you. So this company will provide the office space, laptops, and they will manage all the payroll and the admin staff. But you manage the engineer director, you get assigned them a task, you uh, check their quality and so on. So that way, I think you are able to enjoy the uh, uh, the agility and also uh, it's very easy and uh, quick to set up. Right? I think some companies are offering this uh, model. Uh, at, it's referred to as a BOT, Build, Operate, Transfer. Build means that they will help you hire the team according to your requirements. Uh, operate means that they will do the you know admin stuff, office space, laptop, payroll, and so on. Transfer means that in the end, you, if you are satisfied with the team's quality performance, you are you have the option to buy out the whole team, and and then of course they will become your full time employees. I think this model uh, should work well for a startup because it's quite flexible, quite quick to 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 set up, and also I would say reduces the risk because if you go to a foreign country and set up an entity there, right? There's lots of overhead involved. Yeah, so this. Is, this is exactly the uh, model we are exploring for a couple of open space companies. Uh, so, yeah, I think um, I mean the, the the actual team can from can be from China or India. That is up to the founders to choose. But uh, this is definitely a model we want to explore further. And uh, if the time is right, we can also uh, you know introduce to our uh, other portfolio companies. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Wenpo. Um, You know, there's there are a lot of um, technology related questions that are popping up but i do want to zero in on you know a marketing one um from from sg new house um so i'm going to rephrase the question a little bit right so the question really i think what 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 the question is making the point is that marketing is expensive right and there are many ways we can do marketing so Freddie, I think you know this is a question specifically for you. I'm not even going to attempt to to try to answer this question, but how how should a founder you know think about allocating resources towards marketing? You know, maybe you could give the audience sort of a, a framework or just a way to think about the best ways to reach and acquire customers. Yeah, sure. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it, it it is always going to be expensive. I think. You know, there's no way around it. But I think look, I think that you've got to kind of think about the growth mindset, right? And, and as you think about user growth, you can kind of think about three concentric circles, right? You're going to have in the middle of the users that, that love you, and then you're going to have around it, you know, users that like you. And then, you know, around the very end, you're going to have kind of users that might use you in the future, right? So I think when you when you think about marketing and growing your product, you need to accept that you're going to have those that really engage with you in a loyalist level. And those that are maybe more pragmatic or casual that you also need to, to, to reach as well. And so one of the, one of the biggest mistakes I've seen, and, and this comes maybe a sort of series A slightly later, is that, you know, you don't take a fully loaded kind of full funnel uh, approach, right? And actually you get very focused in, in the short term, pre six months kind of uh, activation campaigns. And reality is like, if you do that, you're missing out on actually making a lot more money in the future. And the reason is um, the right budget allocation, research has shown this, right, is, is actually 60, 40 to long-term brand building uh, campaigns and then 40 to short-term activation campaigns. And that's because those long-term campaigns trigger the kind of responses that build long-term volume growth, price elasticity, long-term brand equity. But if you don't, except that you're going to have to measure things over a kind of longer period than just six months. You're always going to kind of over-index in favor of short-term campaigns that may not actually be building growth in the long run or feeding the funnel kind of on a, on a higher, you know, broader level. And so you eventually you, you get to a point that we, we see with a few of our portfolio companies where they do a lot of kind of short-term retargeting or kind of, you know, performance marketing, but actually the, the acquisition isn't going up high enough and, you then have to kind of question whether you're doing enough kind of broad reach campaigns, um, which come at a higher cost. So your, your, your acquisition cost is going to go up, but equally you need to kind of begin to build and feed that top funnel. And so I think that's probably one of the issues is, is when you think about how, how to do the right allocation is, is technically at 60, 40 um, in terms of what you should do to build your brand on that sort of more emotional equity level. And then the short term uh, sort of activation and, I think you know one brand 
it's not one we, we we invested in, unfortunately. But McDonald's back in the day I used to work with them, you know. And at one point, zero and um, zero percent of their budget of marketing went on um, long term brand building. They they completely switched to this kind of short term activation. And they came and said, and we, we worked on some campaigns for them. And they said, well, we're not growing. We're not really kind of acquiring customers. And we said, well, okay, well, let's try and transition that that spend a little bit and reallocate it. And this. They kind of, we worked with them to create some pillars, right? So they had product pillars, which were around kind of value. And then some of the brand building pillars, messaging pillars were around trust and um, and kind of uh, uh, favorites, right? Kind of your, your, your long-term favorites, things that you remember from your from your lifetime. And they kind of allocated about 30% then to that brand building and, and in proportionately kind of their acquisition of customers started to grow again and, and sales growth started to go up. And they've kind of continued on that on that trend towards the optimum 60 40 split so again i think part of the problem is it, it depends on stage but certainly you get to a certain point where you have to consider full funnel and if you don't do it uh, you, you'll get into a situation where again we've seen some of our portfolio companies they actually get left behind um, because they're kind of so focused on that short term and, and other competitors move faster and do allocate that higher spend to awareness but in the, in the end you're building long-term equity and you're building long-term value even if it comes at a slightly higher cost for those, for those broad reach campaigns. Yeah, thanks, Freddie. And you know, to to add to that, and just hearing Freddie talk about branding and you know how he helped us at Open Space and our portfolio companies think about their brands this way is exactly why we have you know this full operations team, right? Because you know, I'll be the first to say, uh, being uh, financed by background investments, I will never think about branding the same way. And you know, I always advise our companies to grow, but at open space, we like to help them on how they can grow, not just, you know, pushing from the investment side, but, you know, um, having actually someone who who's been in the weeds and you can roll up their sleeves and sort of go, go to war with, uh, you know, uh, our, our founders and their teams. Um, I mean, I would, I would, a lot of the kind of the, what I was saying about long-term campaign building, right. And the need to allocate budget to kind of broad reach campaigns flies in the face of a lot of kind of modern online marketing orthodoxy, right? And a lot of people would question it because they need to see that uptick. They need to see the growth. And you can do that if you just have a kind of an imbalanced scorecard. But if you kind of move to a more balanced scorecard where your long-term metrics are around equity, um, econometrics, you know, fame and creativity metrics, et cetera, and then you've got your short-term uh, funnel, you know, measurements of things like persuasion on on an offline response and all those kind of elements. You actually have a, a more balanced scorecard to prove that you're you're doing both and you're you're achieving growth in both. So I think if you you know part of the issue is it's very hard to measure some of the the longer term stuff. But if you create that balanced scorecard and you do show that you're achieving uptick in in both, then it becomes a lot easier to persuade people that the spend is is worthwhile. Yeah. Definitely. Um, and the, the balance, you're saying the balance scorecard is a you know, perfect segue into sort of the next question, right? Um, so we've got a lot of uh, questions related to tech. Uh, we've got a lot of questions related to marketing because those are usually top of mind for the founders. But at Open Space, we've always put ESG, um, you know, equal to each of these fields as uh, something to think about, not just for us as an investor, but also for our founders as a uh, a portfolio company or, or, or in their startup operations, no matter what industry it may be in, right? Um, and and Jack, I want to throw this question to you because uh, here in the Philippines, you know, we're pretty behind when it comes to awareness of uh, ESG, what it means, and you know why founders should focus on it. As I mentioned earlier, you know, they're they they want to focus on customer acquisition, they want to focus on the technology, but not a lot of founders actually think about ESG. So maybe you can share with the audience why it's such a big priority for us at Open Space and how founders can think about implementing ESG into their operations, you know, even at a very early stage. Yeah, so I guess one of the quick things that I would say about this is that ESG actually overlaps a lot with customer acquisition. It actually overlaps a lot with, with tech as well, right? Um, and a lot of people tend to think that ESG only applies to them if they're an impact startup or they've got manufacturing in the supply chain or, you know, there's like a potential of modern slavery in their supply chain. Um, but it's actually, I mean, I think the way to understand it is really uh, it's a bunch of non-financial operational risks, right? So, for instance, 
um, do you have a good hand, um, say, if we're talking about S, right, um, and social in terms of how you interact with your stakeholders, do you have, say, a good um, customer service feedback team where, you know, the, the, the stuff that's coming in from your customers gets up to management um, on a frequent enough basis and with enough granularity so that that can feed back into how you're adjusting your product for your stakeholders, right? Um, do you have an employee engagement mechanism in place so you can tell if people are upset working for you? You know, are you working them too hard as a lot of startup founders do? You know, um, what are the early kind of flags um, that you can pay attention to to make sure that you don't have a team you know, that leaves you completely to go for a competitor startup, right? So a lot of these are really managing um, non, non-financial operational risks. Uh, for instance, we're working with an Indonesian fintech portfolio company now to build out an enterprise risk management framework, uh, which include, of course, not only financial risks, but also includes risks around, say, um, do customers know what they're buying? Um, are they going to get upset if they lose money on this platform? Right. All these are things that you don't necessarily think about, uh, maybe because you, you just want to grow. But in order to make sure that that growth is sustainable, you got to think about, I guess, a responsibility to the people that you're serving, the people that you're employing, um, an ability, I think, at the most basic to comply with kind of regulations around this space. Right. So it's you know, it's not something that you think about, I think, in the first six months of your business. But definitely as you're growing into, you know, the first, second year, um, you'll definitely see elements of ESG starting to come into your operations already. I think it's just maybe a lot of people think that ESG is about fighting climate change and that's it, right? But it's not. It's really a, an expansion, I think, of corporate governance in a way that makes you accountable not just to the people that own your company, but anybody that your company impacts, right, as, as in the course of its business activities. Yeah, uh, totally agree with that. Um, you know, prior to open space, I was one of those people that Jack was talking about when I think about ESG, it's just about climate change. And then I saw, you know, all of the work that, that Jack puts into uh, helping our portfolio companies and also evaluating investments. And, you know, it's it's way more than that. It bleeds into every other a aspect of, uh, of the business, right? Um, I'm getting a lot of questions from uh, the people in the audience relating to how we do our due diligence and how do we decide uh, whether to invest in a startup, right? And I think each of us can sort of share uh, different insights on how we do that because, and then I'll start off here, you know, being part of the investments team. When, and I'll, I, we, I will admit that compared to the other VCs, we, will, we are probably uh, ones who take a little bit longer compared to the usual on the average. So, uh, you know, we, we do have a running joke uh, on the investments team that other funds out there, you know, they can bring a printer into the meeting and they can print the term sheet after the initial pitch. We definitely cannot do that. Um, but, you know, that there, there's a reason to that, right? And the reason really is we want to make sure that when we invest in a portfolio company that, you know, our, our experts here can share their time and their resources. We don't want to spread them too thin, right? We don't want to make uh, ha have a situation where one portfolio company is, um, you know, not getting the same attention as another one, right? So um, going back to the question, which is, you know, how do we decide whether to invest in a startup? At least, you know, I can speak from it from the investment team point of view. Uh, ultimately, we're going to do uh, due diligence process, uh, you know, calculating uh, the returns, the potential returns our investment would have, because at the end of the day, we are a venture capital fund and we do have, um, you know, promises to our investors that we will make them returns on the capital they trusted us with. So that will um, entail, you know, uh, a full commercial DD. We will understand um, your metrics, we will understand your financials, we will understand your growth plans, and you know we will try to get on board with the vision you have created from your startup. Um, but a uh, part of that due diligence is we're also going to be looping in, as I said, our operations team here to evaluate all of the different uh, aspects of the business because we can't just evaluate it from the commercial side because the tech has to work, uh, the brand has to work, uh, ESG has to work for you know for the commercial side to actually. Uh, realize uh, the returns, right? So maybe we can start off with uh, Wenpo, given that, you know, um, 
part of our process is you coming in and doing your tech DD, especially on you know companies that rely heavily on their infrastructure. What what are some things that you look at uh, when you are in that DD process, and what founders what what can founders expect in terms of what you'll be asking? Sure. Yeah, I think uh, when I do the technical due diligence, so uh, of course uh, we talk about the tech system, the infrastructure, and so on. So it will it will be great that if they already build a system that is based on the latest tech stack like serverless, AWS, Kubernetes, and this sort of stuff. But if, in fact, I would rather focus on the people than the tech stack. Uh, the reality is that uh, for very early stage startups, it's always lots easier and quicker to start with the monolithic application from the very beginning, because you, you never know whether you're going to make it to the series A, right? So why, why bother to come up with a fancy system and then spend two years to develop it rather than get it done in three, six months, right? So I think don't, I, my advice to the uh, CTO or the founder is that don't be concerned about your tech stack, whether it's new or it doesn't really matter. So what I look at during the DD, uh, tech DD process is really the people or, or the CTO. So I do want to see in the CTO that he knows what he knows and he also knows what he doesn't know. So what this means, he knows what he, knowing, knowing what he knows means that he knows his system inside out. He's, he's can explain the design choices and why. I think that's very fundamental and very important. Otherwise, you know, you cannot just borrow some open source and then put together and not knowing what's going on, right? Uh, the other part is equally important is knows what he doesn't know. He, this part means that he knows there are limitations in the team or in the system. He just doesn't have a solution. But I think that's fine. Uh, we, are we are ready to help as long as he's able to formulate, as long as he knows the limitations, he's able, he will be able to formulate the problems properly. And then we can hire the right people to solve it. Uh, open service can help them solve the problem. So I think, I mean, long story short, uh, to me, I'm not concerned with old tech stack or, you know, monolithic applications, even though people talk about, you know, distributed systems, serverless, all fancy stuff, that's totally fine, right? So the, 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 I mean, the team has to be honest and know exactly what they have built, also know their limits. So yeah, we can help them scale. Uh, Jack or, or Freddie, maybe you guys want to uh, add to that, um, you know, how you guys have done diligence before, what you guys look for from, you know, startups we're evaluating for, for a potential investment. Yeah, so very similar for us. I mean, because we're looking at a lot of the companies at very early stage, they're unlikely to say, you know, even meet half out of all the requirements that we have in terms of what's an ESG best practice, right? So for things like, you know, FMB, for instance, we would just prioritize um, you know, things like food safety or employee safety in warehouses or, or bakeries, for instance. Um, if they're a transport company, they also need to make sure that, you know, they're not, say, creating certain incentives for people to drive too quickly or uh, take too many trips in a day, right? Um, but what we look at, like Wimpo said, really is a commitment to constantly kind of be responsible to their employees as well as to the community, right? So, you know, in terms of the business model, you shouldn't be intending to make money at the expense of people who are not sure what they're buying. You know, you're not exploiting people by paying them, say, unreasonably low prices so that you can increase your own margins, right? And then, you know, later on, obviously, after we invest, we work with them to put in place uh, proper policies and processes, you know, business intelligence systems, proper supply chain management. But at the beginning, it's really, you know, are you people that are looking to build a company that's going to be making your 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 money in a in a responsible way, I, I would say. And that's quite easy to tell, I think, if you ask the, the right questions. Over to you, Freddie. Sure. Thanks, Jack. Uh, I, I think obviously we, we, we do our marketing due diligence, but I think one thing we layer on top of that every now and then when, when, the, when the moment is right is, is brand due diligence. And it's not a phrase that I'd certainly heard before until we started saying it here, right? And that's really to say, you know, yes, you, you've got your marketing, your, your CAC, your LTV, all these kind of elements that matter. But let's also kind of look it up a level and go, 
you know, how, how well do you see your vision? How, how well can you articulate what you want to do, right? Because, you know, you need to be able to be conscious of what you're going to grow into, right? You have your customers of today and then you've got your customers of tomorrow. And, you know, we go back and say, well, if Uber had said, oh, we're just going to be a, a taxi company to the 1% of, of commuters, but rather than we're going to be this kind of mobility company and just keep the world moving in more interesting ways, you know, their potential would have been much more limited. So we look at kind of how well can you actually articulate your vision? How do you see yourself growing into that? And then also I look at, you know, how well governed is your brand within your business right now? Because it says a lot about whether they're kind of a brand ready business or whether they see it as kind of that guidelines that they sit on the side and blow the dust off every now and then and, and kind of get out when they have to commission an agency. And so I think, again, it just, it just, it's more of a mindset than it is kind of any particular scorecard. But I, I would also counter one thing that I, I would say with, with the due diligence process that kind of counters, you know, I mean, once I was saying, yes, we take time and we do, and thank God we do, I think it lets us take high conviction bets. But you can look at it as due diligence, or you can almost look at it as, a, as sort of pre-preparation, right? And because we put so much effort in upfront, if we do kind of give you a check and we invest, it means literally from one day to another, bang, we can start work on fixing all those things or improving all those things, right? We don't have to go through a period after investment where we're kind of dating and have to get to know each other and figure all this out. So it actually enables us to hit the ground running extremely fast. Yeah. So for instance, like, you know, two weeks ago, we made an, an investment in Indonesia, had a long due diligence process, and like already less than 10 days later, we're kind of deep in conversations about their marketing and their loyalty program. You know, we're connected to the team. We've got them on WhatsApp. And it, it just means we, we can kind of, the time we might spend in the due diligence process, we make up for post-investment because we can move faster than probably anyone else who uh, printed the term sheet in the meeting room, as, as Wancho said. Yeah, I would say that it removes lots of surprises after investment. <laughs> yeah. I feel like yeah. that's what the due diligence process is, right? It's just uh, just making sure that you don't you don't have the surprise around the corner. You know the trouble that's coming sometimes. Yeah. So I, I think I think you know from from what everybody said, right? It's you know as as a VC, we're in we're fully aware that we're investing in early stage companies, and we're not you know we're not expecting you guys to you know having have figured everything out already and we're completely aware that there are going to be some growing pains. And that's the whole reason why we're sort of taking this approach to investing. Um, you know, having these uh, talented people on board um, to help you with all of these issues, you know, be aware of all of these issues. Uh, that's really a core part to our investment strategy. I want to throw one last uh, question um, to everyone. And this is sort of a curveball question. It's not from a founder. I think it's more from... Um, graduates or people who are looking to build their careers right and so it's 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 a bit out of left field but the question is why why did you choose to work uh in a venture capital fund given that you guys are all from different backgrounds um and you know you walk through all all that earlier why did you choose to go to uh, a venture capital fund as a career why open space um I'll let <laughs> i know it's a kind of a question you guys didn't expect but i think it would be Good to end off the session with that. Um, anybody want to start? I guess I can start. Um, so, uh, well, I guess from my background, you know, I've been in, in, in government and then in healthcare. So I've always been very kind of drawn to businesses that make uh, a big impact on society. And, you know, in open space, we're investing in Southeast Asia, right? And Southeast Asia has, I think, huge problems that a lot of startups are helping to solve, you know, financial inclusion, access to health, access to education, um, you know, like agricultural supply chains, making them more efficient. And, and I think it's just, honestly, it's been, it's been an amazing ride, right? For the last two years, getting to build all these different companies together with really motivated founders um, and really getting to understand different geographies and different industries um, it's not something a lot of people, even in VC, get to do, right? Because at Open Space, we are given kind of the license to really get very operationally involved with the companies, which is what, what I like. And I think that, you know, if I had been at a different fund management company, 
or with a different investor, it could be, you know, let's just invest, let's do the diligence and then be quite hands off. And I don't think I would have enjoyed that as much. And so that's one of the reasons uh, that I joined and that I really enjoy being in open space. Yeah, uh, thanks, Jack. I, I don't know. I, I feel like part of me wants to just say that, that I did it to please my father because I think he was so disappointed when I went into a creative industry <laughs> being Germanic. And, you know, I think the first time I got a job, it was in a company called Flamingo. And I explained to him for like half an hour what I did. And he went, what? It's called Flamingo? And it was just, you know, so I'm very glad that he calls me an investment banker now, which is completely wrong, of course. But I think that I worked in consulting for a while. And I think that the thing that frustrated me most was that, you know, you, you would have a project, right? And that project would see its time and then it would run out and you would hand over all the kind of documents, the final piece of work to this company. And then you kind of rubbed your hands, you walked away and you moved on to the next thing. And you never really got to see anything through, right? You never really got to, to see how that gets implemented and how it actually impacts things and how it really changes the business. And so I think what I wanted to keep was the variety the, you know, that you get in a creative agency, uh, the, the people, right? And honestly, like, you know, you're only as smart as the people you work with. And, and like open space, I, I always say, like, I'm super glad to, to work with people that make me smarter every day, right? But you get, you get diversity of people, you get diversity of thought, you get diversity of companies. So that's all the great stuff from a creative agency, but you also get to kind of be there from beginning to end, right? And you don't just walk away from a project. Even when we kind of finish, you know, a kind of engagement like Wembo was talking about where he was, you know, CTO for a while, you're still gonna check in every two weeks or one month with that company. You're still gonna kind of be there if something goes wrong and, and you feel the long tails of, of your work. And I think that's, you know, the real value for me coming from consulting back into, or into something like venture capital. Yeah, I think I share quite similar view as Jack and Freddie. For me, I mean, honestly, it, I thought this was an easy job because when I came for interview, it was like, oh, we just go and talk to the startups and our own company and then understand what's going on. So I thought it was more like an advisor or a cons consulting role, uh, which uh, at that time I was still with Garena or Shopee. Uh, that, uh, I think she was not very well known at that time. Uh, I was basically leading a team for the uh, development of uh, the backend systems. Uh, so uh, yeah, I, honestly, I thought this would be an easy job. Of course, uh, now I realize that, I mean, a few months into a job, I realized that it's, I have to be more hands-on than I expected, uh, but this is just hindsight. The other thing that motivates me to join Open Space is really the chance to get exposed to different businesses and uh, technologies, right? Uh, by working as uh, you know, a tech lead, I have to focus on one thing at a time, but in open space, I would have a chance to talk to very different businesses, e-commerce, video streaming, you know, healthcare, agricultural uh, tech. So, and that's really, I mean, really uh, interests me at that time. Uh, also, I, I mean, personally, I feel that I, I'm probably one who, 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 who will do better in a smaller firm and, you know, at that time, open space is still quite small at 15, 16 people. So I was feeling like I'm joining a, a startup, right? So I'm, I, I could also be riding the wave of the startup in this region. So yeah, I think there are a few uh, a couple of reasons that I, I chose open space. Honestly, I did, not know, I did not know how great open space was at that time. I just happened to be there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thanks, thanks, Wenpo. And um, we're 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 running out of time here, but um, you know, I think what would be great is if each of you could sort of share maybe just uh, last few words of advice in this last minute that we have for all of the founders that we have in the audience. Um, you know, just just some final words if you want to summarize what you want them to take away from you know what you what you said during uh, this session. I'll, I'll let Freddie uh, kick it off. Cool. All right, I'll just try and think. Well, I think one thing I would definitely say is is just like in defense of, of creativity, right? As you as you go about your your work and you build your business and you build your your marketing and your brand, like I think we often undervalue creativity, right? And this kind of this this very rational economic brain of ours says two plus two equals four, but actually when you kind of take a slightly more psychological creative approach, right? Two plus two can equal four or less or more. It's sort of up to you and if you think about some of the great brands in the world, 
you know, why do we drink a drink we don't like, i.e. Red Bull? Why do we buy a really expensive vacuum for a job we hate, you know, Dyson? You know, why, why do we pay so much money for a coffee that we know we can make at home for a few cents with Starbucks? Like, none of these things, like, rationally make sense, right? And I think if you're willing to reframe and you're willing to reposition and think about things differently, you know, that kind of what some people might call some benign bullshit, you know, actually has powerful consequences. So, you know, if we take the same logic of why something like a toothfish got renamed to Chile and sea bass and suddenly it became the most expensive fish on a menu and you apply that to other problems like how do we get more women into STEM or, you know, how do we get more people investing early so they have more wealth? So some of those kind of benign bullshit creative solutions can actually have a huge impact. So just believe in creativity, watch as many ads, read as many case studies, and just try and think about things differently and focus on creativity over just, you know, media and channels. Well, yeah, I, I guess it's time, but uh, I'll just do a, a quick one, right? Which is, you know, ESG um, probably is something that people tend to deprioritize because it's urgent. It's not urgent, but it's important. Um, but I think ESG is probably going to be urgent in the next one to two years. Um, so if anybody wants to find out more about it, just, you know, hit me up on LinkedIn. Cool. I'll keep it short. So I think my advice for the founder is that uh, it eventually it's all boils down to people, right? It's to execution. It's, it's really about people. So when you hire the people, I think it's better to find the one with who has done a similar thing before rather than who has experience with the latest technology because the I mean the experience is only gained through doing that application right the technology is to solve the application problem but you have to already be there to know what is right what is what should be avoided yeah I think that my advice uh, on the hiring part okay great well, you know, thanks a lot, Freddie, Jack, Wenpo, for, for sharing your time with uh, the audience today. Thank uh, you. We're here all the week in Philippine Startup Week. If you guys want to, you know, ask more questions uh, to these guys or, you know, about on the investment side, you know, we're, we're in the booth all week. So just drop by our booth and, you know, it's... thanks again, guys. Sure. Thanks, everyone. Great for the Hope to see you Bye. in person next year. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.